So, before we get started, um, let's let's pray. I really, I do. I want your prayers this morning as we get into this. God, um, help us all to put eyes on Scripture this morning. Help us just to study this for understanding, to meditate on it, to let it challenge us and draw us closer to your heart. Lord, that we would all be in one accord, that there would be no misunderstanding, no division present among us as we examine the scripture. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to 1 Timothy 2 today. As you do, I want to ask you this question. How many of you want to learn how to please God in your daily walk with him? Would any of you say, it's just like, no, I, I'm really just trying to look for a way to tick God off every single day. No, we want to we please God. If we love God, we want to please him. That's how we go into relationship, especially with people that we care about. We are no longer those rebellious children that just say, how can I make my parents' life miserable or my spouse's life miserable? We long to live for, to serve and love one another. So we're going to resume today where we were a couple weeks ago when we left off in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're looking at chapter 2 today. Like every time we dive into God's word, we read for context and for understanding. If we don't try to understand what we read in the context of today's scripture, it might give us the wrong impression of who God is. We must line it up correctly with the whole of the word of God so that we see God's heart for his church and the people in it. Let's remember that Paul is writing to Timothy, a a former traveling companion of his, and now a young preacher that has been taught the word since he was little. Paul writes this letter to this church at this particular time, and it's important that we remember that when we go to apply it to what it means for us today, this was a different time and a different culture. Some things are different than they are now, but some things still apply very much today, just as it did back then. But we will see that, that when, when you look at the culture, the history, the geography, all of that stuff, you have to put that in context. We're going to, as we get deeper into this chapter, I'm going to point out a couple things. I'm going to be like, that is clearly not a, a thing we have today uh, as an issue. Um, but we'll get there. So 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed Two at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Right off the bat, this is a challenging bit of scripture. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you read that and you're like, no, it seems pretty easy, Josh. Well, let's get into it. First off, Paul urges. He lets us know this is important. Incline your ear, lean forward, make sure you understand it, and do it. Do it quickly. Do it often. Do it consistently. Make sure you don't miss this. For what? What are we supposed to do urgently? Well, he says petitions, which are times of asking God for things. He says prayers, which is talking to God like we talk to each other all the time. He says intercession, which is when we specifically pray to God for a person that is not ourselves. When we intercede for them on, uh, when we intercede for someone on their behalf. And he says thanksgiving, which is giving thanks and glory to God. Paul urges these types of prayers to God to be made for who? 
Scripture tells us, for all people. From us, from the people who call God our own and put ourselves under his authority because we have made him Lord, he urges us to pray for all people. And then he adds that next phrase, for kings and all those in authority. I think it's interesting that he does that. It's easy to pray for each other here, right? We have a time of prayer, praise service, um, both uh, Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, we have a, a, then another bit of time of prayer as we, as we hear God's sightings, uh, as we give glory and, and thanksgiving to God, and then we, we pray for your petitions, requests, and intercede for other people. We did all that this morning. Really easy to pray in church. Really easy to pray for each other that we're in, we're in communion with. We've got this connection with. What about other people, though? I'm not talking about your friends and family, your acquaintances. You know, I'm talking about the people that maybe we don't agree with. The people that maybe we don't get along with. Anybody have somebody that they don't get along with? Probably. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm good. Uh, boy, it's good if you walk in peace with all people. Man, I've... Oh, especially when I worked retail, let me just tell you, I could walk into a room and if I knew this person was on the shift with me, I was just like, God, give me strength. There were just those times. And uh, then there are people who have hurt us. I'm not talking about people that, you know, have, have, you're just like, oh, I, I just can't connect with that person. I'm talking about people who have slighted you, offended you, hurt you, made you angry. Um. And then because, you know, this is a political year, 2024, people that aren't in your same political party, maybe. There are just certain people you might not want to pray for out there in this world. Let other people pray for those people. I'll pray for my own. I'll pray for the people that I care about, that, I'm, that I deem worthy. There are people that your only prayer in your heart, that you want to pray for them might be, God, please just smite them faster. <laughs> and that is something that, that, guys, our flesh is so selfish in, in how we want to convey our love for God uh, to other people and to pray for other people. And Paul makes it very clear with urgency, pray for all people. Pray for the kings, for the authorities. Remember the context of Paul's urge to pray. He reminded us in 1 Timothy 1, just the previous chapter, that, that he was one of those people that we would have disagreed with at a time. That would have been, Paul would have been our enemy. 1 Timothy 1.13, just the previous chapter. Paul says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul was the recipient of Holy Spirit filled prayers as he was persecuting the church. The church had people praying for him. We know Ananias in Damascus was praying for Saul at the time because God put Saul on his heart and said, go to this person. Lay your hands on this person. Those that are in Christ knew this truth that Paul speaks about, that they were a sinner. They were the same type of wretch that Paul accuses himself of being, and Jesus still died for them. So we are urged to pray 
for each other and also for those that do not yet know Jesus. And we are urged to pray for all those in authority, for local government, for our governor, for our president, for the dictators and people in this world that our flesh says they do not deserve God's grace. We pray, Lord, interrupt their day. Shine a light in their life and make yourself known. Reveal yourself to them. To the people, to, to, to Putin, to, to all the people in this world that were like, no, there's, there's just no way. God, you are greater. Nothing is impossible, Lord. We ask that you reveal yourself that they come to the knowledge of you. The prayer of a righteous man, guys, is powerful and effective, and if we all prayed with the urgency that Paul says here for all people, I firmly believe it changes the world. The church has got to be aligning ourselves with this scripture to pray with urgency through petitions, intercession, with thanksgiving, just general back and forth conversation with God where we talk and then we shut up and then we listen. We let God talk. We let God speak to us. That all takes practice. That takes discipline. That takes a sacrificial external love for people that goes beyond our usual selfishness and tendencies to do what we want to do. The kind of prayer that Jesus was willing to pray on the cross in Luke 23, 34, God forgive them, they know not what they do. The kind Stephen prayed in Acts 8 before he was stoned to death in Acts 8, 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Acts 8, Saul approved of their killing him. I urge you to pray like Jesus, like Stephen, for the person who talks about you behind your back in school or at work. I urge you to pray for that person that cuts you off in traffic and your flesh wants to swear and curse them out, but instead you say, God, forgive them, bless them. I hope they have a nice day. I hope they get to where they're going safely. I hope they know the power of you and your resurrection. I don't know that person, but God, you do and you care about them because it is your hope that all men and women would be saved and come to the knowledge of you. I urge you to pray for politicians who pass laws that might go against the word of God. Paul was praying for Rome. He had a heart for the Gentiles that occupied his people's land and ruled over them. He prayed for Caesar, who would eventually have him beheaded. If Jesus and Stephen and Paul can pray urgently for people that are doing wrong things, so can we. And we must learn to do it urgently and consistently. And we know that when we do this, Paul says, That it is good and it pleases God because it is his heart that all people would be saved and come to know him. So how bad do you want to please God? It's all we should want to do. One way to do it is to learn to pray with urgency and consistency for all people and for the governing authorities. Verse 4, I just want to point out, also rebukes the notion of universalism that has crept up in some churches. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus died and rose again. That is the truth. The salvation is there, provided by God, readily available. But everyone still has to choose to believe. 
They have to believe that in their heart, that Jesus is Lord, confess it with their mouth in accordance with Scripture, and in doing so, we come to know him. That's what God wants, but he will not force that on anyone. We get to choose. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone's going to be saved. Jesus declares this himself. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We pray for all people. And then we live peaceful, quiet lives in godliness and holiness. And we are heralds and testify to these truths. There is one mediator, one way, one truth, and the life that leads us to the Father. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he was beaten and he was whipped and he was crucified for my sins and for yours because he wanted us to have a choice to know him. What a gift. What a savior. Help me, God, to pray for those who do not yet know, who do not yet understand. Help me to trust. Help me to trust you as you work in their hearts and minds. Help me to show your love and patience and kindness the same way you showed it for me when I did not deserve it. Are we feeling challenged by scripture yet this morning? Because I read that and I was like, whew, okay, all right, here we go. I'm sure nothing else will at all be complicated in this passage. This is biblical sarcasm right there. All right, um, 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Let's put eyes on Scripture. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands with anger or disputing. And then stop. <laughs> we'll get to the next part. This is a call to all churches. Paul uses the plural here. Everywhere. Everywhere men be praying. Guys, you don't have time to get together to pray with your family and with the the body Um, during your day. Make time. Make time. Paul makes it clear this is something that pleases God. It brings unity, peace, love, miracles, forgiveness, joy, happiness, all that. What are we doing not praying together? I hear, sorry, I hear, I, I heard in, in our youth group a couple, three, two, three years ago um, when we started pre-service prayer, uh, I heard over and over again, I don't know how, I don't know how. And so we're like, it's a conversation, just, just talking to God. And, and we taught them very, the way Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, we just taught them to do that. Honor, uplift, glorify, prayer, petition, asking for forgiveness, confession, um, just submitting to God's will. We do all these things, and, and, and now they pray. They know how. Learn to pray. Start by just a basic conversation with God. Ask him, thank him, love him. The God that loves us just wants to converse with us, wants to know us, wants to hear with our own voice how our day went, even though he knows exactly how your day went. He knows the hair is on top of your head and he just says, tell me more. So many times I come home with my kids and I already know what happened that day. I either had a conversation with my wife earlier, I got a text, I got something. I know some of the stuff that happened to them and I'll come in and my littlest son, Silas, he absolutely, he, he's in that dad phase where he just loves me and he wants to talk about me all his day. Um, and he'll just be like, dad, dad, you want to hear what I did today? And I already know some of it, but I'm just like, I want to hear you tell me your version of today. And it's fantastic. At no point would I think of being like, I already know. Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I love him. I want to hear what he has to say. And that's God with us. 
Um, we can't know God if we don't talk to him, and the churches are called to do it. First, by lifting up holy hands. Hands were traditionally lifted during prayer. Uh, that, that goes all the way back to the priests, the wave offering that would be lifted up. Whether you lift them or not today, the important part there is that where you stand, kneel, sit, lift hands or not, that you understand that as you enter in with your heart into the presence of God, which just happens like that, that you are on holy ground. You recognize that God has set you apart unto him and you give yourself to him sacrificially. Your body is his temple. You're not on your time. You're on his. If you go into prayer with that mindset together as one, you become like that upper room, showing up with petitions, supplications, and thanksgiving. And at the end of it, it's God. We want what you want. There's no place for anger or disputing prayers there. I love that Paul put that in. An angry prayer is one set out of your flesh. Guys, I have started prayers in my flesh. Have you ever done that? Where you just come and you're, you're angry and you're worried and you're anxious and you're depressed. Whatever it is, you come in and you're like, God, I'm angry about it. You know, and you just start going off. Um, God says, it's one thing to do that in your prayer closet. We just want to verbally just dump it all out there for, for you and God to hear. I love one of my, my wife's testimony is just the time that she goes out on her dock all alone and she just yells at God. There's a time and a place for that. When we come together in one accord, though, that is not a time for the angry and disputing prayers. Imagine, and guys, this is for example only. This is for example. Um. Imagine if we all got together as we do before service. And we're all, we're holding hands, we're in agreement. And I just prayed, God, I pray for my wife. She's been a real jerk today. Please fix her. That's an angry prayer. And it's not the kind of prayer God wants when we get together. It's not the kind of prayer Jesus prayed on the cross. Let us come together church with the understanding that as we join together we're in the presence of a holy God and let us be spirit minded as we pray saying uplifting edifying loving things now buckle up and pray for me as I read this next part verse 9 I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Again, the text here is plural and would be a command towards all churches, all women in all churches, not just this one. And in our modern society, we can look at that text in 2024 and go, how dare you, Paul? It's my body and it's the 21st century and this is America and I'll dress how I want. So, we don't have some of the cultural norms that they had back in that time, such as uh, what Paul talks about in Corinthians with the head coverings. Um, one of the uh, cultural things right here that Paul just announces is elaborate hairstyles. Specifically, uh, and it says in some of your translations, but that is a call to braided hair. How many of you ladies ever braid, braid your hair before? Scandalous. I know, I know, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, let's pull that back. Let's look at the culture at the time. Let's look at the, the church of Ephesus where this is taking place. There was a lot of pagan practices. There were a lot of temples to false gods. And one of the things that the pagan temple courtesans did was braid their hair in certain styles. These were promiscuous women who were saying, hey, I am available, come get it. And that hairstyle was one of the things that you wore to let people know. Paul is saying, don't seek to follow in those women's footsteps. Don't seek to emulate them. You are set apart, remember? Now, 
we don't have pagan temple courtesans today, at least not in Brooklyn. You go ahead and braid your hair, ladies. It's fine. But, <laughs> but the message is the same. Be careful who you emulate. Be careful who you're giving a foothold in your heart to. Be careful who you're putting on a pedestal. You guys remember, uh, you know, there's that, that show Friends. And way back in the day, um, Jennifer Aniston set that hairstyle called the Rachel. And everyone was just like, I got to get me that hairstyle. And they just wanted to look like, they're like, oh, that just frames her face. I just love everything about that. And that became super popular. That, that's just based on a TV show. It's in a lot, of, for men and women, we want to emulate people that we admire, um, that, that we're like, oh, wow, I, I like that person. We gravitate towards the trends of people we give sway to in our life. But there are times that going along with certain trends will send the wrong message. And I'll give you a very embarrassing example. Um, I was a youth pastor for many, many years. Find myself a youth pastor again. But way back in the early 2000s, um, I tried to be cool and hip with the kids. And I think I was, I, I still am today. I'm very cool and hip with the kids. Um, they're shaking their heads in a way that I think means yes, because that's uh, the cool kid, hip kids do today. So anyway, I'm trying to, to use pop culture terms, and I'm doing this funny little bit up front. And uh, there was a popular song back in the early 2000s, and I thought it meant literally giving the staff tip money. And I'm referring to everyone in the club getting tips. And I make a reference towards this, and one of the, the kids that was very cool and hip to the music of today starts laughing and goes, Josh, that's about people getting drunk in the club. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I, I thought it was literally about tips. Um, you, you have to be careful with your trends, with your pop culture analogies, um, that you've educated yourself, that you know what's going on. Paul is educating the people of today, educating these women, saying, hey, if you wear your hair this way, it's a signal that you are a promiscuous woman. And you could have the most chaste heart, but other people are going to see that this way. And that, just that alone, might mar your testimony towards the things of God. And you don't want that. Let's not just look at what Paul says here, but turn with me to Proverbs 31. Let's let Scripture speak to Scripture. We see this, uh, Proverbs 31, it's a passage that speaks of a wife of noble character. This woman is described as a blessing. She helps provide. She is confident. She is strong. She is dignified. She is wise. And she is not worried about tomorrow. In fact, it says she laughs at what tomorrow would bring. Because she, she trusts in the Lord. And when it comes to her outward appearance, Proverbs 31.30 says this. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Every time we read scripture, guys, especially when we read challenging passages like this, make it a heart issue. Check our hearts. A woman's charm, the proverb says right there, it, it can be misleading and false. Her external beauty that God gave her will not last on this earth, but what will is the eternal, a woman who fears the Lord, who seeks to know him. That is the woman that Proverbs says she is to be praised. She is the one you honor and cherish and sacrifice for day after day. I know this because I married a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm very glad she's not here in the front, because I'd just be, yeah, very emotional. I, here's the thing, without grossing out my children, I still find her external beauty very appealing. But, 
stop it. <clears throat> but let me tell you, guys, the way she chases after God, the way she helps me chase after God and our family chase after God, it has brought so much blessing and joy and peace into our house, into our day-to-day lives. She puts her time and effort into the things that will last And it makes me love her more and more every day. Now let's look at a New Testament reference, 1 Peter 3. We see Peter addressing the wives in the church. Women that have declared Jesus as Lord and have taken a husband. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Such as, again we see this, elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold, jewelry, or fine clothing. Rather, it should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Peter just calls it out. He says, this is a heart issue, guys. If you spend all your time on the external trying to make the beauty that God gave you last, trying to lengthen it, trying to to stay looking that ideal beauty that we see in our pop culture in the magazines and TV shows. He, He says you're missing it. Stop trying to make it about pleasing even your own self and others. Because if all you care about is the external, you're ignoring the heart. You're ignoring your spirit. Inner beauty does not fade. Gentleness, kindness do not fade. And those are the things that God sees of great worth. And trust me, a husband that loves you will see it of just such an immense value. My wife makes my life better, has been for over 25 years now, and I love her. And I thank God every day that he put her in my life and said, marry her. And I thank God that she listened to him as well. Dressing modestly and focusing on the internal, on our spirit. These are things, ladies, that make God happy. So the question is, do you want to make yourself and others happy or God? When we put it like that in scripture, it's like, it's like so many other times in scripture, our flesh just goes, "Mm." Our flesh, as we so often read scripture, God, don't tell me what to do. And we have to decide, is he Lord or not? I'll tell you, when you line Proverbs 31 up and look at the whole of Peter 3 there, you're making making other people happy when you abide by these scriptures. You're setting an example to your husbands, sons, and daughters about what true, unfading beauty is really looks like. Now let's read 1 Timothy 2.11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. 100% guys, I was like, I would like to stop at 1 Timothy 2, 10. Um, But ah, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's let's read some of the tough stuff. Some of the the stuff that has been misinterpreted um, or, or that has been used to push down Uh, one gender over another. Um, I actually thought it would have been awesome to have Tracy teach this part. Um, 
Let's get that out of the way right now. Women can be leaders and teachers. Uh, I love it when my wife gets up here and preaches. Afterwards, people have said to me, wow, I like her preaching more than yours. And I'm like, me too. (laughs) We have a bunch of biblical examples of leaders uh, for God's people like Deborah, Miriam, Phoebe, Priscilla, and more. uh, People that poured scripture into other people's lives who gave counsel. Um, So what is Paul talking about? Guys, I studied this a lot, and let me tell you, there's a lot of opinions and a lot of conjecture out there. I want to give you what we know through other scripture and through the understanding of the original text. For example, quietness, which some translations might say silence. In the original Greek, it means peaceful calm. Uh, I can't not think about Mary and Martha here in this text. Martha, who was running around trying to make sure all the external stuff was done, uh, all of it was ready and perfect for Jesus. And then you have Mary just sitting at Jesus' feet, soaking up the word of God from the source and doing it in peaceful calm and in full submission to Christ. But here's the big part that Paul says that would have been the most controversial thing of the day. We tend to focus on the other part, but this was the controversy of the day. Paul says, the women, buckle up, should learn. Yeah, gasp. They are to be students right along with the men. For millennia, this was not allowed until this guy named Jesus came along and accepted men and women as students at his feet. Paul says, yeah, women, learn. But don't do it by chatting intermittently between each other in the middle of a service, but in quietness and full submission, soaking up the word of God so that you can teach it to others. And for so many reasons, Paul says, I don't allow a woman to teach in verse 12. Obviously, women teach. They can share testimonies. I could give you so many examples about that, but my favorite is, you know, Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection. What does she go do? She goes and tells everyone. She gives her testimony. Guess who I saw? Guess who's back? And she teaches. She tells them. She gives her message. Women are called to prophesy along with the men in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And that goes that goes all the way back to the prophet Joel, where he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. So what's Paul talking about? Here's where the waters get murky. And I want to be very careful to tell you what I know and not what I think. Here's some context. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy's church in Ephesus. In chapter 1, Paul references two men, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who, along with some women in the church, were leading people away from sound doctrine. Uh, Remember, Paul went off on false doctrines in chapter 1. And a lot of Paul's instructions in First Timothy are going to address them and the damage that these people tried to do to the church. It was them or others that were telling people in First Timothy 4 verse 3, Paul says, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. In chapter 5, he has to tell them, Paul has to tell them, it's okay for widows to remarry. A false doctrine had sprung up in this church that sex, all sex was bad, even in the confines of marriage, and that if you'd been married before and were now a widow, that was it for you. If you got married again, you were in sin, and Paul says that is not the case. When Paul says this here in 1 Timothy 2.12, I can say this for a fact. He abruptly changes from his previous use of the plural women as a whole down to talking about the singular, one woman. How one woman, um, so, so we went, how women should act in dress to the singular. Uh, he could be talking about a specific woman, 
But most likely, he's talking about not letting a woman be the head of a church, not letting them be a pastor. In that day and age, it was both against Old Testament law and it was against Roman law, which said that a woman could not be in authority over a man in anything. Christ fulfilled the law of Moses. But he still called us to walk in the laws of men as long as it does not go against God's moral laws. Let it be known, women, you are called to spread the gospel, same as the guys. And the last part of this text seems to come out of nowhere because why are we now talking about the original sin in childbirth? It's important today um, that we understand in that passage because I couldn't believe it, it's been mistranslated this way. Some people are like, all I have to do to, ha- to be saved is to have a baby. No, it's not what that's saying. Not, that's how some people have in, interpreted it. Um, if you have a baby, uh, you know, the, that salvation is, is through having a baby. No, salvation is through Christ Jesus alone. But to help us understand, let's look at Mary, Jesus' mom, uh, and let's turn to Luke 1. A terrific example in the Bible of someone who was, as Paul says, living in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. This is how we're going to close out today. I had this passage in mind to read to you today. I hadn't put it in my notes, um, but it just came to me. I was like, man, this, this, is, this is how I want to close it out. Um, when we're talking about you know, being saved in childbirth and, and what, what all that means. And uh, this passage came into my head. Uh, I believe that is. That's one of those God things. I was just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then my family and I went and we watched The Chosen. Uh, season four, episodes one through three in theater, theaters last night, and it was fantastic. And they acted out this passage that we're about to read in Luke 1, which was a huge God sighting for me. Let's just, let's just look at it. Luke 1, 39. <clears throat> at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. Childbirth and Genesis, the pain of childbirth was part of the curse, part of sin that was allowed in because of our choice. It was part of the punishment of the fall. But through that, came the greatest blessing of all. Through that came the gift of salvation, Jesus Christ, born to Mary. This was possible for Mary because Mary had set herself apart. Mary made a choice not to live for herself. God wasn't going to use a woman 
living for themselves. He doesn't use those people today. <clears throat> what he did was choose a woman, a Proverbs 31 type of gal. God said, I can use her because she'll let me. Let us seek to please God today. Let us allow him to use us. Let us learn to pray urgently. Let us not live to emulate others, but to emulate Christ. Let us seek to know him more. And let his word challenge us and let our hearts line up with it. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May his face shine on you and be gracious to you today. May just all the, the junk that um, you know you need to turn from, may it bubble up to the surface and confess it. And know that God's grace covers it, wipes you clean. He's good that way. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.